Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Weekly Walk. I'm your host, Joshua Ingram. It is Monday, August 2nd, Year of Our Lord 2021. And this is going to be episode number 44. Alright, so I had a few things on my mind here um, throughout the week. The first thing I want to talk about is I've shared um, several times the the acronym that I use for my morning devotion, for my morning prayer time, um, just to kind of help focus my mind and, um, you know, just to control the thoughts and prayer. Because often if I just try to spontaneously pray, It's like I can only pray for a a very short time before my mind starts to wander. Um, And I know, like, something I lack is being able to fight through that. Like, you should be able to fight through that, take captive your thoughts, and just remain in a prayer state until the Holy Spirit draws you into a a fervent, spirit-led prayer. But but often that imagination you know i start um, daydreaming so to speak or even sometimes you know the flesh and the enemy will kick in um and and bring in wicked thoughts into the prayer life and then you feel ashamed and you feel like you can't pray um and other times i'll I'll fall asleep when i try to pray so in order to try to combat that um i created the prayer acronym acronym uh, that I've mentioned on on a few different podcasts, but that prayer acronym acronym is um, prayers P R A Y E R S, and it's praise, request, admit, yield, everyone in which I, I intercede for others, rejoice, and scripture, um, in which I bring a, a scripture to mind. But um, the the thing I want to talk about today is the yielding. Um, and to discuss kind of like, um, this new discovery that I had on how to do that. And I guess it's kind of playing into the last several weeks I've been discussing, um, you know, how to fervently pray, but also to pray your will be done, how, how to balance those two things or how to conjoin those two things. And, um, so, so I kind of been building off of that week by week. And a little bit of insight that I had here um, early last week was on the yielding. So like during my request for per, uh, uh, phase uh, of the prayer is when I bring my petitions to the Lord. Well, I'll, we're all um, just, you know, express my heart's desires, the, the things that I'm currently desiring in life. And... Um, so, like, for instance, one of the things is is I've been praying about uh, moving. You know, I'm I not happy with my current living. Not, I shouldn't say I'm not happy. I'm content with my current living situation. But I'd like to um, move to a different area. Also, you know, I'd, I'd like to just have my um, a, a different dwelling place. Um, so that, that's been my prayer a lot is, you know, just, Lord, please provide the means please uh, provide an opportunity, open doors um, to make this move happen. And so, so that'll be my request along with other things. Um, and then the, when I come to the yielding aspect, um, what I'll do with that prayer is turn it over to the will of the Lord. I'll think, you know, Lord, um, you've heard my desire, but you know what is best. You, you know you have a plan and a purpose. Like we are where we're supposed to be. The Lord has planted us in the situations and living spaces in the towns that we're in for a very specific reason. You know, he has a purpose and a plan for us in those positions. And so my yielding will be, Lord, you know, um, here's what I desire. But nonetheless, Lord, if it is your will that that I remain where I'm at. If this is your purpose for me, if this if you if this is your design, if if it's best that I stay here, um, if you have plans and purposes for me here, then not only let me submit to that that that's the yielding, but also let me be content in that. Let me be satisfied in that. And so my thoughts have led to thinking like 
perhaps the Lord has me here to be a witness, you know, like, like in this current position and place that I'm at, maybe I'm able to affect um, certain people, you know, with my faith or with, with the proclaiming of the gospel or with w whatever, but he has a, a purpose for me here that couldn't be fulfilled elsewhere. And so regardless of what I desire, um, what the, whatever the Lord's will for me is what is best. So I don't want to just submit to it. I want to be content and satisfied in it. And because often, you know, I talked about last week, misplaced desires will lead to um, depression or anger or complaining and grumbling. So to avoid that, I've presented my desire, but then the Lord's will trumps my desire. I desire his plan and purpose for me more than my own plans and purposes. So based on my limited scope of view in my, in my humanity, here's what I see, Lord. Here's what I, I would like. Here's where I would like to go. But based on what I can't see, based on, on your sovereign providence over my life, um, I know that your designs are not only good, but are best. Everything you, you design for me is what is best. And so let me be satisfied in that and content and happy. Um, so again, so it's, it's not just a, a yielding to the will of God, but it's a satisfied, joyous yielding to the will of God. And so that, that applies across the board for all desires. Um, you know, often I'll desire a spouse. And so my prayers are, are geared towards that. And then I say, but, you know, Lord, you know, um, you, you have reasons for me being single. You have good and holy purposes for me being single. You, there's, there's reasons I'm single. There's things I'm able to focus on that I wouldn't be able to if I was in a relationship. Um, and so I, I yield uh, joyously to, to the will of the Lord, to, to his plan and his purposes. And so that, that's been really helpful for me to, to be content and, um, to, to no longer, like, like I said, cause I've, I've experienced often complaining and grumbling in my heart because I desire something that's not being fulfilled. And so instead of doing that, I am recognizing the sovereignty of God over my life and recognizing that um, the lot he has given me is the best lot possible. So, um, that was one thought I had this week. And then another, um, I was talking to some of my brothers during, during a Bible study um, about... Um, well, there was, there was a particular thing in my life here recently, um, some sort of, I, I, I want to leave it vague because I, I don't want to um, be a stumbling block or um, to have anybody misjudge the situation without giving full context. But there was a particular, let's, let's just call it a vice in my life that uh, was not in itself sinful. It's, it's not a sinful thing. I would, I would um, put it in a class of a Romans 14 thing that there's freedom in it. But in that freedom, I started to recognize potential dangers and potential snares in, in this particular activity. And so I thought that I would need to temper it, you know, to, 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 um, not, not necessarily eliminate it, but bring it under some semblance of control. And in doing so, I also recognize that in me, in my nature, in my character, I don't have a lot of temperance. I don't have a lot of self-control. Um, I'm prone to excess. Um, you know, I, 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 whatever it is I'm doing, um, whether spiritual or secular, I tend to find myself doing it to the extreme. Um, just to give an example, like if I'm doing an entertainment thing, if I find a series that I, I want to watch on TV, um, you know, people talk about binging a series, I'll, I'll go to the extreme and I'll watch the whole thing, you know, 
in a very short amount of time and 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 it's not just everything I do I do extreme you know I I, I um, excess is the word and I, I recognize in myself an inability to temper that um, I, I struggle to have control um, o- over the things I do in excess I, I struggle to I always feel like it's um, left unaccomplished like you know regardless of how minuscule or or big a thing is if it's put in front of me if I determine to do it I feel like I have to complete it to the full I have to I have to exhaust it and so um, it, it makes it very very hard for me to leave off of a thing um, it's it's I feel defeated if I walk away from something. I feel um, like I haven't conquered it, like I haven't mastered it, and and that's hard for me to do. I, I that that personality trait in me wants to master everything I do. Wants to to um, and that there's not necessarily bad motives in that. It's just a sense of accomplishment and a sense of victory that that I desire, and so. Uh, but like I say, that 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 creates a lack of self control. When some things should not be done excessively, some things should be done in moderation. And in those particular situations, when when something in excess is negative, I have a very hard time walking away from it. I have a very hard time um, bringing it under self control. And so, while recognizing that in myself. Um, which by the way is one of the reasons I, I would want a spouse when I, when I think about having a spouse, I, there's parts of being single that I really enjoy. I like that I can do all these different ministry things. I like that I have free time for myself and I I can do the activities that I enjoy. So there's, there's a selfishness in that. Like when, when you're married, you have to share your life. You have to share your time. You have to do, um, things that are mutually beneficial. You, you have to submit to one another and you have to sacrifice your time and, 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 um, your hobbies and activities and things like that. And so the selfish part of me enjoys being single because I don't have to do that. Um, I, I can enjoy all the activities and hobbies that I want, uh, without hindrance. And so, um, that's part of why I like being single. But then when I think about, um, having a a spouse, one of the things that I, I really, um, desire, one of the things that I really crave about that is, um, I I've always focused on the helpmate aspect of a spouse and that, um, a helpmate would be able to encourage me, um, in self-control, a helpmate would be able to, um, speak, you know, uh, wisdom into my life in time, basically be a check and balance against my excess. We'd be able to say, Hey, um, you know, it's, it's time to walk away from this. It's time to, to curtail this. And, and I think that would be very helpful. Like, I think a lot of my spiritual walk would benefit from a helpmate, um, just because of that, because of having the encouragement and the support and, um, like I say, it, because I lack self-control, I need help to control myself. Um, even, even when I was a kid, you know, some of the best times of my life was uh, when I was 13, I was locked up in a boot camp for, because I, I got in trouble all the time. And the structure there and the, the instruction that was given to us and the schedule uh, that we had to maintain based on somebody else's um, uh, authority uh, was really beneficial for me and I accomplished a lot there. So I, I've always recognized in myself a need for that, a need for a helpmate um, to, to really uh, curtail my excesses. And so with all that in mind, without having a spouse, um, I, I have brothers in the faith. I have, that's my helpmate, that's my counsel. And so in this particular area, uh, this particular vice, so to speak, um, where I'm unable to have the self-control to walk away from it when I should, um, I made a, 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 a vow to them. I said, you know, I, I give you my word um, that I will not do this thing. And the reason I did that is because um, 
for me being a Christian, like, like one of the main aspects of, of the Christian character, one of the foundational, um, uh, characteristics of the inner man is integrity or virtue. Like you, you must keep your word. Like if you're a Christian, you can't lie. And so if you say something, you must follow through on it. Let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. You know, don't make oaths in, in that, that the context of that is that you should be a person of integrity that doesn't have to make oaths. You don't have to say, hey, I swear I'm going to do this thing. It should just be, if you say yes, it means yes. And if you say no, it means no. And so when I, when I put myself in that position, I, here's this vice that I'm unable to, to temper. Um, I'm unable, unable to quell with self-control. I need additional motivation. I need a helpmate. And so I set this standard and, and gave my word that I would not do um, this thing for, for a set period of time or whatever. Uh, but the reason I did it is because of that added benefit then. Not only um, is the vice itself potentially leading into sin, and, and I, I, I saw the dangers and the snares that were there, although this activity is not sinful in itself, I saw the potential pitfalls in it, but not having the ability to walk away from it because of my lack of self-control, I gave myself another out by, by making a covenant and saying, I will not do such a thing. So now if I were to do such a thing, not only am I walking into danger, but I'm also violating my word. I'm also violating my integrity. I'm, I'm lying. You know, I, 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 I said I would not do this. I have to uphold that. Um, so it, it created um, an, an extra wall to prevent me going down that road. It's, it's not only dangerous, but now it's, it's twofold sinful in that I would also um, violate my integrity. And so that got me thinking about like uh, Job, you know, he said that he made a covenant with his eyes not to look upon a maid. And so Job had, I'm assuming the same way I am, saw the danger of, of lusting after um, a beautiful woman or a beautiful girl. Um, I think, well, regardless of what maid means, but uh, <clears throat> he, he made a covenant to help his self-control. He made a covenant with his eyes so that um, if he were to do such a thing, he is violating his integrity. He's, he's violating his virtue. He's, he's stepping beyond um, his word. He's, 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 he gave his word to himself that he wouldn't do such a thing. And in order to build a wall, uh, a preventative wall to keep him from going down that path. And I thought that was, I thought that's pretty wise and it makes you think about other uh, things in your life, um, whether they're excesses or whether they're outright sin. And thinking about, you know, making a covenant not to do such a thing. And in some areas, it's scary. Because in some areas, it's like when I think about some particular sins that, that have a, a hold of um, my imagination or, or pull me in a certain direction, it's like, uh, they're so powerful and, and it's so hard to resist that I'm fearful to make the covenant because then I would not only be doing the sin, but I would be violating my integrity. It's this idea of, I don't know if I can keep the covenant. And so I'm, 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 I'm scared to make certain covenants with myself, but I, I think there is power in that. There is benefit in that. If you, if you're struggling with something or if there's something you don't want to do, uh, to, to make a covenant to not do such a thing because then it's it's a double sin if you go down that road it's a it's not only are you doing the thing but you're violating your principles you're violating your word and so I think it's just a wise thing to do um, and like I say because Christians at their core are supposed to be virtuous Christians at their core are supposed to be people of integrity uh, where your word means something. You you do what you say you're going to do and you with, withhold um, restrain from, from doing things that you say you're not going to do. Um, so the, I guess that, that 
is the the totality of my thoughts on that. But um, another thing that came to mind, I was out uh, camping this weekend, and often when I'm camping, especially if I'm by myself, because I I don't go to like campgrounds. I do backpack camping. I I go deep in the woods, um, so I'm isolated. I'm by myself, um, out in the middle of nowhere. You know, miles from society, and um, when I'm out there, I'll, I'll, I'll bring my Bluetooth speaker and, and I have sermons and podcasts loaded onto my phone. And, uh, sometimes I'll listen to those, you know, like I say, especially when I'm by myself, um, just to, to keep the mind occupied or to, to, um, just, you know, just to, to, to have something to do out there to, um, keep your mind from wandering into fear. You know, you're looking into the dark woods. You don't know what's out there. You're all by yourself. But um, one of the sermons I was listening to this week was talking about the crucifixion. And so it brought to mind um, something that I've thought about very frequently. And that is when Jesus was on the cross, um, he uttered the phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, he's quoting from Psalm 22. And almost every time that I've heard someone talk about that scripture or a sermon on that scripture, it seems like what what they imply or what they say is being done there is they say that... Um, a, either they'll say, well, Jesus had a, a moment of doubt, you know, uh, why have you forsaken me? And first off, I, I think that's blasphemous because to me, doubt is the opposite of faith and whatever's not of faith is sin. And Jesus was sinless. Jesus did not sin. Even in the hour of his temptation, even in the hardest time that he faced. Um, so I, I reject that outright. There was no doubt there. Jesus was not doubting God. Um, so then the other explanation that often comes up is people say, well, that's where God turned his back. Uh, God the Father turned his back on God the Son. Um, I, which I think they're even implying a separation between the deity and humanity of Jesus. Uh, which, again, would be blasphemous. Jesus was always and always will be fully God and fully man. There was never a time um, where where the deity aspect of God, the deity nature of, of, of Jesus separated from the human. And also, I would, I would reject the idea that God turned it, God the Father turned his back on God the Son. Because this, the entire crucifixion was, was planned by the Father. This was not something that he had to look away from. Um, there, there's even a verse that says, um, oh, what does it say now? It just was in my head and, and disappeared there. But about the father, it, it pleased the father to crush the son. Um, so there was no displeasure there. There was no, uh, God didn't have to look away from the events occurring. God was causing the events that were occurring. He was the, the counsel and the purpose and the plan and, and the means by which this event was taking place. He was the author of the crucifixion. Um, he was pouring his wrath upon the son in order that men may be justified and forgiven. Uh, this was the glorious culmination of all of humanity, of all human history, of all of earth, of the universe. This was the culmination of all time and space and matter. This was the, the event that uh, everything pointed to and everything points back to. This was the culmination. So it, it, it wasn't a displeasing event to the Father. It was, it, it was his plan being brought to fruition and so I, I, I also reject the idea that, that God was looking away from the sun or was separated from the sun in some aspect. Um, yes, uh, he became sin for us and, and God hates sin. So that, that's why there was wrath, but it was justified wrath. It wasn't a blind wrath. It wasn't a, oh, go ahead and drink down the cup while I look away. 
It was God initiating the cup of wrath. It was him pouring it upon Jesus. So, like I say, I, I reject um, outright uh, as, as heretical the idea that Jesus doubted in that moment. I would say that's heresy. I would say that's blasphemy. I would say that's that's wicked. It's it's a it's equating sin to the sinless savior. And I would reject the idea that God looked away or that there was some sort of separation there because I would say that this was God's plan and purpose. This was the fulfillment of all things. This this was God in action. This was not God uh turning a blind eye to it. So then we're left going, okay, so then what is meant by the fact that Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Um, because taken at fa face value, that sounds like God has forsaken or separated from Jesus, or Jesus is doubting uh, the plan. That, Like uh, taken at face value, it, it would seem that that's what's being implied there. My argument would be that it's neither one of those things. Uh, those are dark and grim things. I would say what was being done there was a glorious thing, was an amazing thing, was a prophetic thing, was an evangelistic thing. I would say that what is happening there is Jesus is quoting Psalm 22 to bring attention to Psalm 22. Any of the scribes or Pharisees um, or, or uh, Jewish leaders that were familiar with the scriptures there, when they heard him quote those verses, they should have known, hey, he's quoting Psalm 22. You know, if, if, if you heard somebody quote, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you, you know, as a Christian familiar with the scriptures, you would immediately go, hey, he's quoting John 3.16. Uh, same thing here for the Jews. They should have thought, hey, he's quoting Psalm 22. So then the question becomes, why? Why did Jesus quote Psalm 22? Well, if you go back to Psalm 22 and read through it, it's a it's a prophetic scripture. It's, it's Psalm 22 is all about the crucifixion. It talks about his hands and feet being pierced. It talks about them casting lots for his clothing. It talks about him being surrounded um, by, by the dogs, by, by these vultures, by these wicked people. Um, it, it, in, in, it says, you know, I am a worm and it talks about the scarlet worm. When you look up that word worm, um, do some studying on that. The scarlet worm is, a, is an amazing prophecy. Um, but Jesus was quoting from Psalm 22 to bring Psalm 22 to attention so that the Jews would go, Psalm 22. Oh yeah, that's, that's, oh wait, it, it talks about piercing his hands and feet. It talks about casting lots for his clothing or, or separating his, his cloak. It, it talks about these events. They should have recognized immediately. Hold on. He quoted Psalm 22 to draw our attention to Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 is prophesying about the very events that we are watching occur right before our eyes. Um, so to me, that's an evangelistic attempt. It's an attempt to say, look, you are witnessing these events, which should have immediately caused them all to repent and believe. It should have caused them all to go, hold up, wait. We're, we're seeing this fulfilled. We're seeing Psalm 22 talk about what the Messiah would suffer and go through. And here is Jesus going through the very events of Psalm 22. And in a, in a, in a heartfelt attempt to reach us and, and stir up our minds to remembrance, he quotes the verse from Psalm 22 while acting out the events of Psalm 22. It's, 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 it's a miraculous thing. It's an amazing thing. It's like, if you're picture that, put yourself in those shoes, you're standing there familiar with the scriptures. You hear him quote Psalm 22. You immediately remember what Psalm 22 is about. And then you look and you say, this is happening right in front of my eyes. Truly, this is the son of God. This is the savior of the world. This is the promised Messiah. And uh, I'm coming up on a break here, so just stick with me and we'll pick up on the other side. Hey, welcome back to the Weekly Walk. 
Um, yeah, we were discussing um, the crucifixion and, and why Jesus quoted from Psalm 22 and my thoughts on it. Um, I reject the idea that, that uh, Jesus was in any way um, doubting what was happening. And I'm rejecting the idea that there was some sort of separation between uh, God the Father and God the Son or the deified nature of Jesus and the human, the human nature of Jesus. I deny those and instead I present my theory, my hypothesis uh, that Jesus was evangelizing the crowd um, by stirring up their memories and causing them to remember uh, Psalm 22 and what Psalm 22 talked about. Um, so, so that's where I stand on that. I, I think if you, if you look at it in that way, it's, it's much more glorious than, than the other explanations uh, for my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is, and I don't even really know how to go on this particular subject. It was something that came up while I was camping with my brother. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just going to spitball it here to fill some time on this uh, podcast. But um, it's, it's on the idea of money and um, the idea of saving for the future or, or having a, a savings account, um, you know, in case certain things happen, which on the surface seems like wisdom. But then where I, where I come in on this is I see a, I see a biblical principle that says, uh, don't worry about tomorrow. I see a biblical principle when you think about like the, um, um, uh, what am I trying to think of here? The, the parable of the guy who stored up his barns. He had an abundance of, of um, agriculture. He, he grew large crops that year. And so he said, I'm going to build a big barn and store everything up and take it easy for a while. You know, I have excess. I'm going to take it easy. And the Lord said, fool, your, your soul will be required of you tonight. Um, so that's, that's one aspect of where I'm coming from. Just keep that in your mind. The other aspect is um, in the desert, when the Jews were traveling through the desert, the Lord gave them daily manna. And the Lord specifically instructed them, uh, gather only what you need for today. Don't store up for tomorrow. I will provide for tomorrow. All right. And then also the idea of um, don't worry. Uh, don't worry about tomorrow. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Take no thought about what you'll eat or what you'll drink or what you'll wear. Um, the Lord will provide. So this there's this overall biblical concept that we should not fret or even think about the future. Like, like tomorrow is its own thing. Um, in, in, a, in a very real aspect, we're supposed to live in the moment, in the day. Sufficient for the day is the trouble therewith. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. We trust the Lord in this moment, in this day to provide. Tomorrow's not even a thought. I'm not worried about tomorrow. The Lord will provide tomorrow's blessings for tomorrow. Today, he'll provide today. So then it becomes, but then there's also this aspect of, okay, well, um, does that mean we shouldn't have any savings? And it's, it's like, well, you know, if I have $500 and my bills and, and my food and my clothing and everything I need and any particular ministerial, ministerial needs that, that are present before me, let's say it, it, it runs me $300 for the day. I have $200 excess. Am I just supposed to blow that? Am I supposed to throw that away? Of course not. That wouldn't be wise. Because um, the other aspect of this is we're supposed to be wise stewards. We're supposed to be smart with the things we do. And so that $200 would then be saved for the next day. Um, and so there, you have both of these aspects in play here. Uh, my, my whole thing is, if your thoughts, like what I was trying to explain to my brother is like, there's nothing wrong with saving, but there, it's, there are many, many, many dangers in this, in that a one degree aversion of your mind, a one degree step in the wrong direction will turn to sin. 
it, it will you're setting your heart on treasures of the earth then you're you're um coveting or um greedily holding on to or seeking gain or stepping into the love of money which is the root of all evil so there there's a particular danger with money um that that is hard for me to explain um and and i spent like two three hours trying to debate this with my brother trying to find the right words and um because like i'm not saying don't save money i have a savings account you know i'm sure everybody out there has a savings account so it's it's there's not an issue with the savings the issue becomes if my heart attaches to these savings if if my affections go on to these savings if i start trusting in these savings to provide for my tomorrows if i you know if if my thoughts and my heart become attached in any way i see danger and pitfalls and potential sin so like I'm saying, it's, it's not sinful in itself, but it is incredibly dangerous when a person starts thinking often about saving and about money and about possessions and about needs. The, like it, it almost, when you try to balance the be a wise steward and take no thought for tomorrow, when you, when you try to balance these two biblical philosophies, it's, it's almost like the idea becomes... Um, I'm, I'm going to use my money in a wise way. I'm going to, I'm going to pay my bills so that I'm not indebted to anybody because the borrower is servant to the lender. Uh, we should, we should strive as much as possible to not be in debt to anybody. Uh, what did Paul say? Oh, nobody, anything but love, or, you know, that's a bad paraphrase, but something along those lines, we don't want to owe. And so with my money, I'm going to pay my bills. That is first and foremost. I'm for, foremost. I'm going to make sure that I'm paying off what I owe. Secondarily, um, the Lord has, has given us, uh, we're, we've been born into a society where we use money and finances to purchase food, clothing, shelter, uh, things of that nature, things that allow us to get those like gasoline and things like that. Um, so we use our money for that. Thirdly, um, we ought to be um, using our money um, for the spread of the gospel, for the advancement of the kingdom. And so we should be searching our hearts and, and saying, Lord, is there anything present before me uh, that you would like me to use this money for? Are there any evangelists? Are there any ministries? Is there anything I should be pouring this money into and be led by the Spirit in that? Fourthly, I would say that uh, we owe our pastors double honor. You know, um, we don't tithe like they did in the Old Testament. That that was a Levitical um, theocracy system. That was a tax. It was a government tax. Uh, that's not the New Testament way to give. The New Testament way to give is God loves a cheerful giver. You know, whatever the Lord lays on your heart. There's the, there's no set amount of ten percent. Uh, but there are principles at play. Uh, we understand that our churches have to pay electricity bills and and mortgages and and land taxes. I think I don't know if churches pay taxes on or not, but um, but we know that they have bills to pay, and they have uh, if if your pastor is a salaried pastor, if you have you know if there's employees of the church, um, you want to make sure if you're being fed by that organization. You owe them double honor. You ought you ought to provide for them. You know the Levites didn't have anything of their own. The rest of the of Israel provided for them. In the same way, we ought to be providing for God's ministers. And so, not just your church, but any ministries that you use. You know, if 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 you um, listen to Paul Washer, give to the Heart Cry Ministry. If you listen to John MacArthur, give to Grace Community. If you listen to Pastor Piper, give to Desiring God or Bethlehem Baptist. Whatever it is, you know, whatever ministries you're using. If you use uh, Bible Gateway, make sure they're funded. Um, so so you and and that's all going to be prayerfully led as well. So so you have your bills, you have um your your life's necessities. You have ministerial needs, um, and then you have um, the the organizations and ministries that are pouring into you. 
Um, and then, I, out, then the fifth thing outside of that would be, um, I see nothing wrong with, you know, buying things uh, that that bring you pleasure. You know, if 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 they're not sinful things, I I like buying documentaries and books, and I put a lot of money towards that. Um, you know, if if you have particular hobbies or whatever, and it's it's an enjoyable thing, I I don't see anything wrong. You know, if you like fishing, I don't see anything wrong with buying fishing gear and things of that nature. Um, so that's your daily living, and then if you have extra after that. And, 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 and you've searched your heart, you, you've prayerfully considered, and there's nothing else that you really feel pressed to give to, um, then yeah, that can go into a savings account. But at that point, your thought should stop on it. It should almost become a non-thing. It should become invisible to you. It's not even there. You're not concerned about it. Your heart's not set on it. Uh, you're living each day as it comes, not worried um, about what's in the bank account or not thinking about what's in the bank account or not trying to build bigger barns. Um, just, just being satisfied in totality with, with your daily needs and with what you have with no mindset on that tomorrow. Um, uh, because I think that's the danger. I think that, that, like I say, money is a particularly dangerous thing in which it seems, so prone to grab our attention, so prone to get grab our affections, and 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 we get so focused on it, and 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 we we think in our we 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 plan out all these emergencies that are going to happen, and we think, well, I'm going to need, you know, I need I'm going to need ten thousand dollars in the bank, I'm going to need twenty thousand dollars in the bank, I'm going to need thirty thousand, and and it grasps your heart, and 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 the thing with accumulating money is it's never enough. There's always going to, you know, that, that desire grows and grows. So I think there's a particular danger in, in setting your affection or mind or thoughts on the tomorrows. Um, you know, let tomorrow worry about tomorrow. Sufficient for the day is its trouble therewith. So just, it, and like I say, it's this weird thing of balancing. Does that mean, oh, I shouldn't save anything? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying live for today and whatever's left over. Yeah. Put that in the savings, but don't even worry about it. Don't think about it. You know, it's, it's, um, be wise, be a wise steward with your money. Don't just frivolously throw it away when you know, Hey, I'm going to need new tires here in a week. I'm, you know, I'm going to need, um, you know, the, the refrigerator's 20 years old. That's probably going to go out. I should probably set should have something for that, but don't let it take your affections and, and don't let it take your desires. It, if that makes any sense, like I say, I, I spent like, you know, we spent like two, three hours, um, debating this issue and trying to talk this out. And, um, my brother had a lot of good points and I felt like I had some good points, but I really couldn't find the words to convey what I was trying to say. Because it just sounded like I was saying, oh, hey, don't save your money. And it, it sounded like I was saying, um, if you save, it shows that you're worried and anxious about tomorrow. And then that becomes sinful. And that's not really what I was conveying. What I was trying to convey is that um, money has a particular danger in, in, a, in a very subtle uh, way of drawing our affections and attentions down to earthly things rather than heavenly things. It has a tendency to draw our attention down from the heavens onto the things of the earth. And so knowing that danger, you have to be very, very cautious and like almost come to a point where you don't even care um, about money. And, and like, it's just a thing. It's just a, uh, a nonsensical thing that's here today, gone tomorrow. It's irrelevant. It's it's a it's a it's a blessing uh, when the Lord gives it to you, and w when it's gone, it's irrelevant. You know, the Lord provides each day, and so it's it's that weird. You know, trying to balance out these these two philosophies of of being a wise steward and and not frivolously throwing away uh, your resources. And also just living for the moment and trusting in the Lord. And so you, you got to find a way to balance those two things. 
But anyways, uh, that's uh, all I've got for you here uh, this week. Um, so um, as I, you know, Lord willing, we'll talk to you next week. And as always, uh, I really, really appreciate you listening. I love you and we'll talk to you next time.